Good morning and welcome. Today we'll be talking about AMPS code chapter 20 for AP US history, uh, which is all about becoming a world power. Um, so this is the age of imperialism for the US um, as European countries are going especially to, to the scramble for Africa. Um, the US is extending their feelers, their political, military, economic power, um, really almost all over the world, especially to Latin America and to Asia. Um, and so we'll explore today the U.S.'s rise to becoming a world power after the Civil War. And you will see in the time frame here, 1865 to 1917, hopefully those two years might sound familiar. 1865, that's the end of the Civil War. So this chapter is, is happening at the same time as the Gilded Age, at the same time as the Industrial Revolution in America. And then 1917, you might remember that year, that's in the middle of World War I. That's when the U.S. joins World War I, which puts an end to this phase of imperialism. I've got my notes set up. Um, I, you'll see that I'm going to be kind of giving some definitions and, and motivations of imperialism first. And then we'll bounce around a little bit between these um, uh, slides, looking at first some examples of imperialism and then different approaches that different uh, presidents had in America. All right, so uh, imperialism itself, sometimes called new imperialism to distinguish itself from old colonialism. The first wave of old colonialism, that was the 1500s and 1600s, God, glory, and gold, the 13 colonies. New imperialism, about 1870 to 1914, and it's best captured by the scramble for Africa. Um, whether you were in World or AP Euro last year, you probably saw a map that looked like this that showed how all of Africa by 1880 to 1914 was nearly completely split up, except for Ethiopia and Liberia, and colonized by European countries. Um, and what you're gonna see with uh, uh, American imperialism is that the motivations are basically the exact same as with European countries. So I'm not gonna read through all of these slides. Um, I'm just going to um, kind of summarize maybe the different motivations of imperialism. Um, one of the biggest ones was economic, um, certainly to get raw materials um, and to have more trade. We saw that with uh, European imperialism in Africa. There's also a political motivation of not wanting to be seen as a second class nation um, or believing that uh, you might remember survival of the fittest or social Darwinism basically said, uh, the strongest countries deserve to have colonies. And so the U.S. wanted to be seen as strong. Um, there was also a military motivation. I suppose military and political kind of go hand in hand. Um, but this was to create uh, naval, naval bases um, and to have a strong navy. And then there was a, um, I'm gonna call this cultural motivation and it includes religion, um, but there was the idea of trying to spread uh, uh, civilization and spread Christianity to these quote unquote savages. Um, you might remember a poem that we read last year called The White Man's Burden. I'll actually put that poem in here. Um, white man's burden by rudyard kipling who wrote take up the white man's burden savage wars of peace fulfill the mouth of famine and bid the sickness cease um, it was the idea that white civilization was superior and so it was their burden or their responsibility to spread uh, uh civilization to the rest of uh the world fulfill the mouth of famine feed them bid the sickness cease cure them and whatnot um, and then there, uh, uh, the popular press also printed adventure stories, and so imperialism was kind of seen as an adventure. Now, if you were to dig into what the actual like main motivation was, I mean, I think cultural is probably not the main motivation, but all of the other three, the economic, political, uh, and military motivations, I think all were valid uh, uh, as kind of the, the primary motivations of the U.S. Okay. Again, we're going to jump around um, on these notes a little bit, um, looking at some examples. I'm going to first start with um, the two examples of imperialism that became U.S. states, Alaska and Hawaii. Um, Alaska was purchased um, um, in 1867 um, by Seward. That was the Secretary of State during Lincoln and Johnson. Um, it was purchased from Russia. 
Alaska had gone back and forth in terms of who controlled it. Um, but eventually in 1867, um, with something called Seward's Folly, um, the U.S. purchased Alaska um, in 1867 uh, for $7.2 million. Quite a bargain. Um, although at the time, everybody thought that it was this huge mistake. They called it Seward's Folly. Folly means mistake or, or, or foolish or something. They also nicknamed it Seward's Icebox because they thought Alaska was just worthless frozen tundra. It wasn't like the Louisiana Purchase, $15 million for you know, some of the best uh, agricultural real estate in the world. Um, they thought it was just a frozen tundra. Eventually, they'll discover um, the natural beauty, but also the oil in Alaska. But at the time, it was considered a mistake um, for the U.S. to purchase. Um, Hawaii as well. Hawaii was quite a bit different, though, because there was a revolution there. Um, there is a native Hawaiian uh, peoples. There was an entire native uh, society. There was a native monarchy, um, a, a, a native government and culture and society in Hawaii. Um, and the U.S. actively overthrew um, the, the Hawaiian monarch. Um, there had been uh, Hawaiian missionaries and settlers who, who lived in Hawaii since the mid-1800s. Some of these were missionaries trying to spread Christianity. Some of these were entrepreneurs trying to invest their money and create uh, uh, new, new, new industries and businesses, especially in sugar, bananas, things like that. Um, and so the U.S. supported, uh, in the late 1800s, the U.S. supported their, um, the Americans who had lived in Hawaii, who had really colonized Hawaii, um, to overthrow the Hawaiian monarch. Um, Hawaii was annexed in 1898, became a territory in 1900, but not a state until quite a bit later in 1959. But by, but by, by 1900, Hawaii is a, an American territory. Um, so let's see, um, Hawaii becomes U.S. territory in 1900, um, after the U.S. Uh, essentially overthrows the Hawaiian uh, monarchy or queen. All right. Um, much of uh, the U.S.'s uh, imperial adventures takes place in Latin America. Um, and I want to uh, actually go back up here, here to this idea of the Monroe Doctrine. Hopefully you remember the Monroe Doctrine, but that was back in um, the 1820s, I believe. Um, the Monroe Doctrine basically said um, that the Western Hemisphere belongs to the U.S. Um, and the, the, the Western Hemisphere is off limits to European colonizers. It's US territory, basically. It's, it's the US is to control and to decide. Um, and so the US, the US liked to consider themselves as the protector of Latin America. I'm gonna put that in quotation marks because what we'll see is, well, they have a very um, twisted definition of how to protect Latin America sending in troops, colonizing, suppressing revolutions, and things like that. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll explore that contradiction a little bit today. Um, yeah, um, so uh, the US uh, had a decent hand in, in kind of the development of Latin America from 1820 until modern day. Uh, some of that is encouraging cooperation, uh, such as the Pan American Conference that first met in 1889 and still exists today. Although much of what we'll see is them having a heavy, heavy hand in uh, military interventions to gain control or at least profit off of Latin America. Um, and the biggest example of that is the Spanish-American War. I'll put uh, 1898 up here so we know exactly when this takes place. Um, Cuba was a Spanish colony. Um, Cuba was a, an incredibly profitable Spanish colony uh, with a, a huge sugar um, uh, trade there um, because of the climate is perfect for sugar, large slave population there as well. Um, and in the late 1800s, the Cuban peoples begin to rebel against Spain. Um, the US, both from their Monroe Doctrine approach Europeans need to get out of the Western Hemisphere. We need to protect our American, well, that's a more broad use of the word American. Um, we need to protect our, our North American brothers. 
And then also from an economic motivation, we need to, you know, take advantage of, of the resources there. Um, the U.S. decides to support this Cuban rebellion against uh, Spain. So the cause of the Spanish-American War, um, the U.S. decides, or the U.S. supports uh, Cuban rebellion against Spain. Again, some economic motivations there um, and some uh, political motivations there as well. Um, and the one specific incident that uh, really forces, or not forces, but pushes the U.S. into war with Spain is the main. The main was a ship um, that in February of 1898 uh, exploded, killing 260 Americans. Um, at the time, the U.S. said that they were attacked by Spain, that Spain had launched a torpedo essentially at the main. Um, since then, it's been discovered that that probably didn't happen. The main probably exploded because of an internal fire or something like that. But the U.S. didn't care. The journalists didn't care. They wanted blood. They wanted uh, war. And so the main became a rallying cry. Remember the main um, became a rallying cry that pushed the U.S. into war um, against Spain. So remember the main. Um, so the U.S. joins war or declares war rather after the USS Maine explodes, uh, killing 260. Okay. <clears throat> now, even going into war, the US said, um, we don't want to take over Cuba. We just want to liberate it. That was the Teller Amendment. Um, and William McKinley, the president at the time, he said, we're going to, to war in Cuba against Spain to put an end to the atrocities in Cuba, to help the Cuban people, to protect the Americans in Cuba and their wealth and then also to restore American trade and restore peace in the region. And so you can see there that the American motivation was um, political and economic, probably more than anything. I don't know if they really wanted to help the Cuban people. They cared more about protecting American trade. So I'll just actually say here, um, the goal here maybe is to protect uh, US trade and peace in the region maybe. All right. Um, the Spanish-American War uh, fought against Spain was fought both in the Philippines and Cuba. Um, and uh, the U.S. provided some troops. You'll see it was mostly a, a volunteer force. Um, Teddy Roosevelt, who's going to become a U.S. president uh, uh, 10 or 15 years later, most famously fought in Cuba as part of the Rough Riders. Um, that was the, their nickname. They were uh, a volunteer horseback army um, so yeah, um, Spanish-American War, uh, it's not fought in Spain, it's fought in the colonies, in the Spanish colonies of Cuba and the Philippines. Um, the U.S. joins forces with the native peoples, the Cubans and the Filipinos, um, and within months, Spain gives up. Relatively short war. Um, the war itself ends with the Treaty of Paris. Um, you might uh, be wondering, well, okay, there have been a lot of Treaty of Parises. Um, it's just a common place for, for countries to meet and sign their treaties. Um, and the Treaty of Paris most significantly, most significantly gave the US control of Puerto Rico and Guam. Puerto Rico and Guam are still American territories to this day, neither of them are states. The US also kind of, sort of, gained control of the Philippines. Um, well, I, 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 I say kind of, sort of, because um, they'll get their independence and the US, I don't know if the US helped them gain their independence, but the US didn't actively try to annex the Philippines. And then I'm gonna put Cuba in parentheses as well. Um, Cuba officially became independent after the Spanish-American War, although, um, we'll see down at the bottom here, the U.S. did force some conditions uh, upon the Cuban people in order for them to uh, gain their independence. So let's dig into this real quick. Um, Cuba here, um, with the Platt Amendment, Cuba basically said, we are not going to belong to another country. We are going to be free and independent. And the U.S. says, um, okay, but only if only if you give us a, a piece of your land on the uh, eastern shore called Guantanamo Bay. Um, and the U.S. was going to use that as a naval base. Um, so Cuba gains their independence. Um, but 
Um, the U.S. gains uh, control of Guantanamo Bay, and then they also gain some, some trade rights in the region. The U.S. still controls Guantanamo Bay. It's, it's quite uh, controversial in Cuba because Cuba has um, some very rough relationships with the U.S. We've cut off trade with them for the last 60 years, and yet we control this piece of land called Guantanamo Bay. Um, we oftentimes uh, hold suspected terrorists there because since they're not on U.S. soil, we don't have to charge them with a crime and things like that. Guantanamo Bay is quite controversial for both Cubans and for Americans as well. Um, the Philippines, um, uh, uh, meanwhile, um, kind of sort of gained their independence. Um, um, the U.S. decided not to annex the Philippines um, for a handful of reasons. Um, it says here that um, some people, anti-imperialists, thought that, well, there's such a different culture, they couldn't assimilate into our culture. Um, other people thought that it would just be kind of too much anarchy um, and whatnot. Um, trying to subdue the peoples. Um, and so the Philippines um, will eventually get their independence um, a few uh, not centuries, a few decades later. Um, and I'll actually point to this real quick. Um, there was a case that went to the Supreme Court that asked, did the constitution follow the flag? Meaning, okay, um, Cuba, Guantanamo Bay, um, is, is colonized by the US, but it's not an American state. So does the constitution still apply in Cuba? Do people living in Cuba still have the rights of the constitution? Supreme Court said no. That's why among other reasons, Puerto Rico is not a state. Puerto Rico doesn't have senators, doesn't have representatives um, among other uh, privileges that, that, that Puerto Ricans uh, do not have because they're not officially part of the US. Okay, so Teddy Roosevelt or Theodore Roosevelt uh, rose to prominence or rose to popularity uh, during the Spanish-American War. Um, and when he became president in, in the 1900s, um, he uh, came to be known, uh, or kind of his approach came to be known as big stick diplomacy. And what he said was speak softly and carry a big stick. Um, this was Theodore Roosevelt's basically aggressive uh, foreign policy approach. Carry a big stick, meaning we got to go into these territories and smack them around until uh, they do what we want. And so, um, I mean, you might say that we've already seen an aggressive foreign policy approach um, versus Spain and, and versus the, the Hawaiian monarchy, but we're going to see an even more aggressive military uh, approach to imperialism in the early 1900s with Teddy Roosevelt. Um, some of that involves the Panama Canal. Um, Panama, so you can see in this map, ooh, you can see in this map down here, Panama right here in Central America. Um, before the Panama Canal, if you wanted to, to sail from New York City to San Francisco, it was a 13,000-mile journey. With the construction of the Panama Canal, which literally dug a canal into the most narrow part of Panama, it also went through several lakes. It wasn't just one straight line. It went kind of lake hopping. That journey was cut um, by what, 70% from 13,000 mile journey to a 5,200 mile journey. Um, other Europeans had tried to build a canal. France had tried to build a canal. The US had tried to build a canal in the 1850s, um, but it wasn't until 1914 and then finally finished in 19, sorry, it wasn't until 1904 and then finished a decade later in 1914 that the US finally built the Panama Canal. This was all because of trade and also military reasons so that, that the Navy can cut through here. Um, very long story short, in order for the US to build the Panama Canal, they basically had to orchestrate a revolt um, within Panama for Panama to get their independence from Colombia. Um, now, you might be thinking, oh, you know, that's, that's so great. They're, they're supporting the, the independence uh, of Panama, but no. The US only did that so that they could build this canal and profit off of it. Um, so I'm gonna say the US helps build um, the Panama Canal in 1904 to 1914. And this is gonna lead to uh, increased trade uh, and also a stronger Navy. And then I will add that the U.S. Uh, um, uh, orchestrates, I'll just use the word in the, in the um, slides, orchestrates a revolt 
versus Colombia in order to uh, be able to um, build this canal. Um, the Panama Canal was officially um, controlled by the US for 100 years. It was actually just a few years ago, 2014, I guess, when uh, control rights finally shifted back to the uh, Panamanian people. Um, so the US controlled the Panama Canal for 100 years. And that means then that they controlled the economic profits and the military benefits of the Panama Canal. Um, now, Teddy Roosevelt, um, um, he believed in the Monroe Doctrine. Monroe Doctrine, again, um, says that um, Europe cannot intervene in the Western Hemisphere. Basically, the Western Hemisphere is America's sphere of influence. Um, and Roosevelt added his own little wrinkle to the Monroe Doctrine. Um, Long story short, um, a lot of Latin American countries were massively in debt, especially to European countries. Um, most of Latin America gained their independence in 1810 to 1820, and independence was a bit challenging for them at first. Um, they also had to fight plenty of wars um, uh, uh, against the US and other countries. Um, and so a lot of European countries would send uh, soldiers to Latin America to forcefully collect their debts. Um, this was in direct violation of the Monroe Doctrine, which said that Europe's got to stay out of Latin America. Um, the What's called the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine, or the Roosevelt like Amendment, or Roosevelt Change to the Monroe Doctrine. Um, Teddy Roosevelt actually allies with or agrees with the Europeans on this side. He says, okay, um, the U.S. will help these European debt collectors. U.S. sailors and Marines will occupy uh, uh, Latin America's major ports until those debts are paid back to European countries. Um, now, this might seem kind of weird at first because um, the US is going, is turning their backs on the Latin American people and siding more with the Europeans, which goes against the Monroe Doctrine. But what this really did is this gave the US an excuse to send their troops into Latin America and to gain control of the ports, to gain control of the trade, to gain control of the profits, maybe even to replace the government if there's a government that's unfriendly to America or to the Europeans. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna add this under big stick diplomacy because uh, it, it is, it is uh, Teddy Roosevelt, although it's kind of Monroe Doctrine. Um, <clears throat> so his version of the Monroe Doctrine, um, the US, um, sends troops to Latin America to force them to pay off debts to Europe. And again, this, this justifies the US sending troops to Latin America. It says there over the next 20 years, they send troops to Haiti, Honduras, uh, the DR and Nicaragua. Um, and this is um, just the, well, not just the beginning, because the US already had rough relationships. It's the next chapter in a, a, a very rough relationship between the US and Latin America. The US saying, we will send our troops to your country to force you to pay off your debts. And until you do what we're happy with, we're gonna stay here and occupy your ports and uh, collect taxes and maybe change the government and things like that. The last example uh, or examples um, of imperialism, of American imperialism is in Asia. And this is gonna be much more economic imperialism rather than uh, military imperialism. Um, the open door policy with China, um, very long story short, I'll, I'll project all of these slides, but I'm just gonna summarize it. Um, very long story short, a bunch of European countries, Russia, England, France, Germany, they all had their, their, their spheres of influence in different regions of China. They all had their own ports. Uh, England had Hong Kong, for example. Um, France had Macau, whatever. Um, so each European country had their own port. No other European countries were allowed to trade there. Um, the U.S. was worried about losing access to China. And so the U.S. sent a diplomatic note to all of the European countries, basically asking them to accept an open door policy to China, um, which basically meant that the US would have access to all of these ports. Um, no nation rejected it, 
And so the U.S. said, okay, since no one said no, that must mean yes. And so the U.S. declared that all European countries had accepted. And the U.S. began to follow this open door policy. Uh, open door policy, again, means the U.S. can freely trade in all parts of China. <laughs> um, now, the U.S. is going to have some military interventions there as well. Um, they're going to help to crush the Boxer Rebellion around 1900. Um, so this isn't a full innocent, you know, only economics here. This is uh, uh, using economics to get the U.S. into the door, and then they will use some military interventions as well. Um, so again, the open door policy basically says the U.S. Um, has uh, free access, I guess, to all trading ports in China. <coughs> um, Japan as well. Japan's a little bit different um, because the U.S. and Japan had had some relationships. Um, there was a, a decently large Japanese population, Japanese American population in uh, San Francisco. Um, but around 1900, there had been some tensions between the U.S. and Japan. Um, first, um, uh, Japanese uh, students, Japanese American students living in San Francisco had to go to segregated schools, which angered the Japanese. Um, secondly, after a war called the Russo-Japanese War between Russia and Japan, um, Teddy Roosevelt negotiated the, the peace conference, I guess, um, and Japan felt like they didn't get enough of what they deserved. So there were some tensions between uh, Japan and the US, um, but it begins to be, um, repaired, I guess, through economic agreements. Um, in 1907 to 1909, uh, Teddy Roosevelt sends uh, the Great White Fleet, a massive naval fleet around the world, uh, basically to show off military power. And they enter into uh, the Japanese harbors um, as well. They're welcomed um, with open arms, I suppose. And uh, this begins to, to mark a, a new era of more cooperation, I guess, and, and free trade between the US and Japan. It also says here that the US and Japan both agreed to respect each other's colonies in the Pacific. The US had Hawaii uh, and Guam, for example. That's gonna stand until, I suppose, um, 1941 um, uh, uh, with um, World War II, the attack on Pearl Harbor and other American colonies. Um, so while well, so the US also negotiates um, free trade with Japan. Um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Um, the last two slides are going to be these last two approaches, dollar diplomacy and moral diplomacy, some of which we've already talked about. Um, dollar diplomacy, I think we've already seen this. Um, this is, okay, so big stick diplomacy is aggressive. It's using force, uh, using troops to gain power. Dollar diplomacy, as you can probably guess, um, dollar diplomacy is all about uh, economic interests. Um, so relying on economic investments and trade, uh, not force to spread US influence. And so what does this look like? This looks like um, investing in railroad companies in China or uh, investing in sugar or banana uh, industries in Latin America. Um, so this is all about investing in railroad, um, railroads or uh, I don't know, banana or or sugar companies um, as a way to get the U.S. in the door, that their foot in the door. Um, now this was sometimes used as an excuse, or sometimes used to justify sending U.S. troops. Um, and so that kind of economic and military uh, uh, motivations do kind of blur together here. Um, but um, yeah, a slightly different approach. I'm going to put here real quick, big stick diplomacy. Um, this was um, Teddy Roosevelt. Dollar diplomacy, this is William Howard Taft. Two different approaches. The last approach is moral diplomacy. Uh, this is Woodrow Wilson, who is president during World War I, so um, 19... Uh, uh, mid 1900s, sorry, mid 19 teens. Um, and Woodrow Wilson's moral diplomacy approach, as you can see in the uh, uh, word moral there, believed that the US um, had a moral responsibility when negotiating in world affairs. Um, Wilson said he opposed imperialism, he said he imposed dollar diplomacy. Um, 
And so what did Woodrow Wilson do during his presidency to um, be more moral? Well, he, get, he granted full territorial status to the Philippines and he granted uh, full rights to the Philippines um, to kind of set them, I suppose, on the path toward independence. Um, with the Panama Canal, remember the US controlled the Panama Canal, Woodrow Wilson said, no, we're gonna pay our fair share to go through. We're not gonna go through for free. We're gonna pay our fair share. Um, he also entered a bunch of treaties with other countries promising to solve conflicts diplomatically rather than through war. But um, Woodrow Wilson also sent troops to Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Um, he had uh, uh, a series of wars with Mexico um, from 1913 to 1917. He only stopped because uh, of World War I. Um, so Woodrow Wilson, um, I mean, like anybody, he had, he had values. His values said that we should negotiate fairly with these countries and we should use American power to spread American values and American morals. And sometimes he used the opposite. He used military force and military might, American power to crush rebellions. Um, so I'll put both of them here. Um, so he said his goal, I suppose, was to uh, approach foreign affairs uh, morally. So for example, he grants rights to uh, the Philippines. Um, he pays taxes to Panama. Uh, he creates plenty of treaties. Looking ahead a little bit to the 14 points, which you might remember from last year um, after World War I, um, Woodrow Wilson uh, also believed in self-determination for colonies, that they should uh, be able to decide for themselves what they want to do. But again, he still um, got involved in uh, 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 military conflicts, especially with Mexico. So. He's not a full on good guy. He was also a crazy white supremacist, um, but we won't get into those details right now. All right, so to recap, cool. We are exactly at one page, awesome. Um, again, I was jumping around to the notes a little bit, but we've got our motivations of imperialism and our different approaches, both aggressive using force and economics. Pause here if you need to. And then we've got some different examples of imperialism as well. I'm actually gonna highlight the Treaty of Paris, uh, or actually I'm just gonna highlight the Spanish-American War in general. Um, and, and then the Panama Canal as well. So we have some uh, military examples, Spanish-American War, Hawaii, and we have some dollar diplomacy examples, Panama Canal kind of sort of open door policy as well.